a little bit of the history of the church. It's amazing, you know, you, when, when I knew this was coming, I did send emails out to many people and say, could you tell me some things? And of course, it, it sort of falls by the wayside for most. So last week was a bit frantic, phoning people, asking them for information. How did Rydale Evangelical Church come into being? Well, you have to go back to the time before the church existed locally. There was a man here called John Monroe. John lived in Pickering. He taught at Ascom Bryan College. He had come here in 1969, and if I can catch Jean Brumby's eye, she, you thought it was 68, but we'll not argue until later. He, he came here in 69, and he was quite definite. That was the year he got married, so I think he would be likely to remember it. So he came here, and through him, a work was begun. I need to back up just a little bit. Around the same time, maybe just a little prior, a lady called Jan Mosley, who is known to all of us since Robert's mother, she's now passed on into glory. But a lady called Jan Mosley went to her mother's funeral in Sheffield. Her brother, John, was a believer. And after the funeral, he invited her to what she thought was a concert. It was, in fact, a rally at which the Reverend David Watson was pre preaching. And she was converted there. When she came back here, she went to the parish church. She lived in Kirby Moorside at the time. She went to the parish church where she was told by the vicar that she would be all right. She would soon get over it. If, if you knew Jan, you would find you would know very much so that she never got over it. She, she knew the Lord and loved him. She was put in touch with John Monroe by David Watson from York. And through that, Bible studies were started. Jean told me that John Monroe turned up on Peter Brumby's doorstep one day looking for advice on how to proceed. And Peter then came to Pickering, I don't know for how many years, on a Tuesday to lead a Bible study. And then from that, the little what was then called Pickering Christian Fellowship grew and developed. There was a difference arose within the fellowship over the, the, the gifts of the charismatic gifts of the spirit. And the, the Pickering Christian Fellowship was for them. And there was a, a substantial bunch in the group who weren't. And they then started to attend Whitby Evangelical Church. Um, speaking to John Brown this week, he says, way back then, they actually thought the church at Pickering would have developed before Whitby. But Whitby was just beginning to come into existence about then. Maybe I should have checked my dates with some of those folks, but just about then, allow me some uh, flexibility. And the folks here from Pickering then attended church in Whitby for four or five years, I do believe. And then as the group had grown and they were traveling 20 miles every Sunday across the moors, and it's fine in this weather, but in the winter it can be a real experience. So as the group began to grow, they then were encouraged to begin meeting here in the Pickering area. They, they actually began in Kirby Moorside. There is a picture in a frame at the back if you want to look at it later. And that reminds me, if, if you're looking at the picture, perhaps you could sign the visitor's book so we can remember that you've been. And um, there's a second copy of it in the back room. And you can see the, the small group of people that were in it. Six of them have gone to glory. Um, but when that group was formed, the Reverend Keith Morris had just finished LTS, I believe, and in a joint move between Whitby Evangelical Church and York Evangelical Church, Reverend Richard Brooks, um, Keith was pointed in this direction and became the part-time pastor of fledgling Rydale Evangelical Church. And you'll see him in the picture there as well if you want to take time to look at it. So that would be something of the very beginnings of it. He, he, he lived in a house which had been loaned to him. And it, it became clear that it, it, the people who owned it, it needed it back. So 
he was then left in a dilemma, as he says in his little note here. I'll give you a copy if you want it. Um, that he didn't know quite what to do to support his family and carry on. And around that time, a friend of his who had gone to West Australia um, made, it aware, made him aware there was a vacancy there as an assistant pastor. And from there, he went to Australia. I did write down the names of the churches. Maybe he'll tell us them later. But he went to, I hear it is Mount Hawthorne Baptist Church for four years. And after that, St. Columba's Presbyterian Church until retirement. Um, I, the church then began to search for a, for a minister. And I think it must have been the link with Peter Brumby because Peter Brumby went to BTI in Glasgow. They wrote to the, the college in Glasgow and I can remember to this day the principal showing me this little letter about a place called Pickering. I had no idea where this was. It wasn't even on my radar. I'd never heard of it. But as you do at those times, you, you follow up where looking to see where God was going to lead you. And I came here then in 1987 to begin the ministry here. I brought with me Kath, my wife, and our three children who've all grown up and have their own lives now. And so the, the, the ministry here, with the help of a good number of churches and organizations were able to provide a full-time salary for me Early on for many years i wish i could tell you this was a regular congregation but it's not um we've had our ups and downs and we may be in a bit of a, a low at present but the lord is with us that a really good bunch of folks look at what's in the back room and you'll see how much effort and time they put into making things like this happen. Look around the chapel. All of this decoration has been done by our folks. There's only been a very few bits of the work here done by professionals. I should have said we were unable to have access to this chapel seven years ago. It was quite derelict. There's a picture on the wall behind me of what it looked like seven years ago. And then the Lord enabled us to, to bring it up to this lovely condition with no debt at all. We believe God has put us here. And finally, we have a permanent place to hang our name. So we're not just meeting in a school and then vanishing again. And we're working hard to make contacts with people in the locality and to see if what can be done to further the cause of Christ. I'm beginning to waffle. It's time to stop. But that's a, a very quick and um, brief overview of the work of God here in Rydale. We covet your prayers. You'll notice I'm no spring chicken. We would love to find somebody to replace me, to keep the church going and to lead it on into the future. One of the phrases John Monroe used and has stuck with me, he says, looking back, he says, we were planting seeds. Many seeds have been planted around here. We're praying for the harvest. I said to William in the room at the back there that I, I, I am very glad to have the opportunity to come back after all these years. It's a great privilege. And I, I seriously, sincerely count it as a great privilege. Um, you might want to know a little bit about us. Um, I went to university here in Yorkshire, even though by birth I'm a Liverpudlian. I'm proud of it. Um, and I worked here for a number of years and was a member of York Evangelical Church. And from there came here. And then after a couple of years or so, financial circumstances 
together in the Lord's providence meant that our time here was finished and we were to move on. But two of our children were born in Yorkshire. Uh, so there's always a part of Yorkshire that's in our hearts. In fact, I often say to my wife things like half of Yorkshire would hear that or such things. So it's, it's a part of us. We went to Western Australia to a Baptist church under some misapprehension because when we arrived there, we found in due course <clears throat> that things were not entirely as we expected. And uh, chiefly, the statement of faith of the churches in Western Australia had nothing to say about justification. And over the course of time, I inquired about this and people didn't want to talk about it. And eventually I pressed a little bit more and was very firmly squashed. And so it, I came to the conviction, the conclusion that this is not the place for me. And so we moved over to Presbyterian Church and I served there for more than 20 years. And uh, the Lord encouraged and provided. And uh, I retired from there. Retired. It's a very rubbery word for ministers. Yeah, I hope you all know that. Retired actually doesn't exist for ministers. It's just a pretense. It's a, 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 a hypocrisy. But technically I re retired in 2012. But continue to serve as the Lord gives work to the old horse. So that's us in a nutshell. So it's a great honor, privilege, and joy to come to see that you have a building here and the work continues and the gospel is faithfully preached. How faithful William has been with his wife all these years. I'd like to turn your attention, if you'd like to turn to your Bibles now, to Revelation chapter 3. I'll read the whole chapter, but we're particularly going to focus upon the letter to the church at Philadelphia. Let us hear the word of God. And the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, 
that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten therefore be zealous and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <clears throat> so let us sing praise once again. From our hymn book, it's number 361, or in the old book, 332. The Spirit breathes upon the word and brings the truth to sight. Thank you. 
Our text this afternoon then is from Revelation chapter 3 and from verse 7 to verse 13, the letter to the church at Philadelphia. Friends, we live in a world that is changing and the pace of change seems to be increasing rather than diminishing. And our world and society, I'm speaking as one who lives on the other side of the world, but I'm speaking generally of Western culture in particular. Our Western culture is no longer stable, it's unstable. And landmarks that stood for generations are being slowly undermined and some have already been eroded and removed. So it's fair to say, I think, that Western society has lost touch or nearly lost touch with its Judeo-Christian heritage. And where once it was understood that Christian values and morals prevailed in our society, that can no longer be said, I believe. Many people in our society are indifferent. They don't care to hoots so long as they're fed and clothed and entertained. But some are very actively hostile. And that's true internationally too. You have only to read or watch the news <clears throat> week by week and you will see or hear reports <coughs> of people being attacked and killed, even in the mainstream media, which is not really concerned about such things at all, but in various Christian sources, uh, you will hear of people being attacked and killed and, and so forth. Uh, just recently, the last couple of weeks or so, we heard before we left Australia that an Australian medical missionary to Niger, um, who had been captured and imprisoned, held as a hostage in that part of the world for, I think, seven years from memory, had been released. Uh, that was great news. In Christian circles, people were rejoicing. Did it make the mainstream news? I don't think it did, but maybe it did. But worse than that, in parts of Nigeria and in other African countries, tribesmen attack villages and kill people and cap capture others and all of this is going, it's an ongoing thing. Tens, hundreds of thousands of Christians are being imprisoned or orphaned or widowed or killed. That's the world, the grievous world in which we live. Now, in Philadelphia, the synagogue was attacking the church. They were saying, we are the people of God. These people, they're heretics, what they call the way. They think they're following the Messiah, but the Messiah is, the Messiah is still coming. We know we are accepted in the Roman Empire. We are a legitimate organization. But these people, who are they? You shouldn't give them any attention whatsoever. And these slanderous accusations, false accusations, showed them to be serving the devil rather than the Lord they professed to serve. And that kind of scenario is not absent in these days either. But I want to focus upon the church at Philadelphia and hopefully help us to see how it has some important uh, encouragements for us in these days. And first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the church at Philadelphia from the text before us. I want to point out first that it was a weak and a struggling church in verse 8. I know your works. I've set before you an open door, uh, for no one can shut it, for you have a little strength. That's a key phrase. You have a little strength. You're not influential. You're not many. You're not wealthy. You're not significant in the eyes of the authorities. You are a weak, small, despised minority. There are quite a lot of churches who fit that description today, aren't there? 
And then in that context, to that little congregation, the Lord Christ reminds them of his divine sovereignty. And he appears in full sovereign regalia, more glorious, more beautiful than the king at his coronation. He is described in three terms. He is described as the holy and true. Holiness and truth are the manifestations of his intrinsic dignity and majesty as the eternal son. Later in this writing in chapter 6 and verse 10, we read of uh, saints under the altar crying out, O oh, sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood? So the same description, exactly. And if that is not sufficient, then I remind you that in the prophecy of Isaiah, maybe you know this already, you perhaps remarked upon it as you've read. In the prophecy of Isaiah, the Lord is described 20 times approximately as the Holy One of Israel. The Holy One of Israel. So that's the first manifestation. The second is his absolute sovereignty, described in verses 7 and 8. I have the key of David. He opens, no one shuts. He shuts, no one opens. I have set before you an open door. These are ways of speaking of, of sovereignty. I control. I am the king. I decide. I give. I withhold. And then further, his omniscience, the, the Lord who knows. There's nothing hidden. And you see that in verse 8. I know your works. His eye is upon them. Nothing is hidden. He sees everything. Not just the outward works, but the motivations, the attitudes. He hears the words. And that's true still. In every church, in every generation, in all the world. So the net thing that we draw from this is that all the doors to human usefulness, to human happiness, to human uh, fulfillment are at the disposal of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then further, notice that this church received no rebuke. In five of the other cases, the churches were rebuked for something or other. For example, in Ephesus, uh, you've left your first love. You've got all this good stuff going on, lots of wonderful things, lots of praise. But you don't love me as you loved at first. But here, no rebuke. And further, they are commended. They have kept his word. They have not denied his name. Faithfulness to the word, to the revelation of God, to God's truth, and to the name and glory and intrinsic uniqueness and holiness of God, they have been faithful. They're commended. We may deny his name or be unfaithful in a whole list of ways. I'm just going to mention without elaboration at all. We may be, we may be unfaithful through unbelief. We just can't trust God in this situation. Or through worldly mindedness. Yeah, I, I, I know I have my duties to the church and the Lord, but I have to. Whatever it might be. Or through religious formality. Oh, it's Sunday again. I've got to go to church. Or through neglect of personal devotion private prayer, meditation on the word of God, participation in the sacraments. Matthew Henry helped me, and I give a quote, a short quote from his commentary. True grace, though weak, will do more than the greatest gifts or highest degrees of common grace. For it will enable the Christian to keep the word of Christ and not to deny the name. Obedience, fidelity, and a free confession of the name of Christ are the fruits of true grace and are pleasing to Christ as such. 
And isn't it true that to every believer, everyone born of God's spirit, the, the name, the word of God are precious? Can you bear to hear people blaspheming or saying the Bible is just a lot of nonsense? Can you bear that? It troubles me and I expect it troubles you as well. But here's another point. For churches in general, but for the church at Philadelphia in particular, congregation, that they faced severe opposition, that they had constant struggles. All of these things were true of them. They are no signs of God's absence or God's displeasure. Sometimes people lapse into the way of thinking, well, if God were blessing the work, we'd be growing. People would be, would be converted week by week. Uh, the, the, the offerings would go up. The community would be interested. Well, we'd love to see that. Every one of us, I should suspect, would love to see that. But the fact that they are not happening, the fact that we are a despised minority as Philadelphia does not mean God doesn't love us. In fact, the opposite. The text tells us they will know that I love you. This is a very important truth for us to take to heart, friends. God loves his people. And even though there may be just a handful, his love is unwavering and steadfast. But the church at Philadelphia needed encouragement, as we all do, sometimes at least. So the next thing we move on to is to notice the encouragements that are given to this church, and hopefully that they will give to us as well. First of all, there was an open door. I have set before you an open door, verse 8. What does that mean? Well, I've come across two interpretations, two understandings. Both are possible, I think. The first one is the suggestion that it means that you still have opportunity to evangelize. You still have the freedom to speak the word of God to friends, neighbors, to have public meetings. That's a possible interpretation. It's supported by the fact that in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9, Paul wrote, A great door for effective work has been opened to me. A great door has been opened to me. So he used it in that sense, writing to the church at Corinth. That's possible. The other possibility is that it means an open door to heaven. This is my view, my personal preference. If you look to the first verse of chapter 4, in the immediate context. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. So it seems to me that what is being said here is that while the Jews were trying to close the doors to have the church extinguished, to silence the message of Jesus as Messiah, God was keeping the door open, the door to heaven, which meant first that they could constantly pray, and secondly, that that's where they were headed, no matter what happened on earth, that that was their final destination. So the first encouragement, they are to take heart that the Lord reigns. He has the keys of David. He is the sovereign. And uh, they have the open door and he's keeping it open. Then secondly, the uh, statement of his providential care during their trials in verse 10. I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. And that leads also to the statement in verse 9 of final vindication. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not but lie. I will make them come and worship before your feet. That word worship probably is better translated bow down, kneel, rather than worship, which implies uh, worship to God. So they are promised God's providential care. And 
The scriptures show that that's always the case for the faithful people of God. I remind you, for example, of how God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. And despite the fact that they were a wayward and stubborn and idolatrous and foolish people, he sustained them 40 years in the desert. Not just 50 or 100, but hundreds of thousands of them sustained with manna and water and quail. God kept them. Nothing is impossible with the Lord. Or think about David, the young David being pursued by King Saul, who'd realized or heard that David was anointed to replace him and was chasing him after his life. And how David found a place to hide and Saul heard news that the Philistines had invaded and so was forced to give up pursuit of David and to attend to the Philistines who had come to attack. Or think of how our Lord Jesus in his great high priestly prayer in John 17 says in verse 15, my prayer is not that you take them, the believers, that not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them. And the whole metaphor of shepherding also reinforces that, doesn't it? The Lord is my shepherd. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. A shepherd cares for the flock. He protects them. He feeds for them. Feeds them. He provides water, nourishment, all that's necessary. He, he does for the flock. And that's what's being said uh, to the church at Philadelphia and to the church here. Then thirdly, he promises them vindication in verse 9. I will make them come and bow down before your feet. They say you're heretics and fools and troublemakers, but I will make them recognize who you really are. But the question may arise, why would these hostile Jews bow down before these Christians? Why would they? How could that be? What does it mean? It might mean, on the one hand, that some of them would become Christians. And then they would recognize and they would, metaphorically speaking, come and say, yes, you were right. You were right after all. Jesus is Messiah. We were wrong. I'm sorry we, we hated you. Maybe. Or possibly... In the final eschatological judgment, when all the books are open, when all the secrets are out, when the judgment comes, then those Jews who hated the church will recognize as they face the judge of all the earth, that rather than serving him as they thought, they were persecuting him. Remember Saul, the Pharisee, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Saul is a great example of this kind of hatred that there was amongst many Jews. Then fourthly, encouragements, Christ's coming, the coming of Christ. He has not forgotten us, he's not unconcerned, he's not remote, he is not powerless. He says, I am coming. In verse 11, behold, I am coming quickly, or I am coming soon. And in the book of Revelation, that's repeated frequently. The promise to the church in the first century, under those difficult infant days with so little um, public support, as it were, Several times, five times in all, in chapter 2, chapter 11, chapter 22, three times. The coming of the Lord Jesus. And we should never forget it. The world is not going to go on indefinitely as it is. It's not a clock winding down. It's not controlled by governments and authorities. It's not evolutionary, as many people think. This is vital for the church to remember. This is God's world. He is its sovereign Lord. 
and one day he will come. He's the Lord of history. And he will judge. And on that day, his faithful servants will be vindicated and welcomed. Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. From the perspective of eternity, the return of Christ is always soon for Christian people. From eternity, it's always soon. It's the next big thing that will happen in God's plan and purpose. The day of our marriage supper, the day of our wedding, the day of feasting, the day of final consummated union with the bridegroom, with Jesus. The day of the end of our sufferings, our sorrows, our tears, our setbacks, our weeping, our conflict. It's coming to an end, friends. But to be ready for that day, they must hold on to what they have so that no one will take their crown. Verse 11 says so. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. It's a warning. A reminder that Entrance into the glory of God is not automatic, that we can't put up our feet and fall asleep in the sun, as you, if you like. That we are in the world with a purpose and a function and, and that we are not to relax and regard that as insignificant. We are to hold fast, not deny his name, not deny his work. And uh, that's reinforced in verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let him hear. Not only the promises and the encouragements, but also the reminders to hold fast and to persevere. But to keep a firm grip in days such as we live in, days of rapid change, can be difficult. Let's be quite blunt about it. It can be really difficult sometimes. And you will be aware, perhaps more or less, that in some denominations in this country and other countries too, there is compromise. People are giving ground, allowing things into the life of the church that 100 years ago, even 50 years ago, would have been unthinkable. And so we need the reminder to hold fast, to stay firm, to be faithful. And this is our duty. This is what we're called to. Persevere. In faith, in hope. And thirdly, this, this afternoon, because there are promises of eternal blessing to those who hold firm. Look especially at verse 11, especially verse 12. Hold fast that no one take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. Those are promises, friends, promises from the living God, promises to his faithful, persevering people. Let's analyze them a little bit. These promises in verse 12 emphasize the depth of God's love for his people. They're generous promises. They're abundant. They are presented, first of all, as a crown. Let no one take your crown. And that's a, a picture from the Greek games. And uh, one authority says, and I quote, it is the crown of victory in the games, of civic worth, of military valor, of nuptial joy, of festal gladness. Equivalent in our generation, in our world, I think, to the Olympic Games and the gold medal presented to the victor in the athletic, athletics race or 
javelin or whatever it might be, the gold medal, the, the, the token of, of uh, the best, of victory, of conquest. As we think of the athletic metaphor, let's not think of the 100 yards or the 100 meters. Let's think of the marathon. Because the Christian life isn't a sprint. It's a marathon. And if you think of the long distance runner, even though he trains or she trains a few miles today, a few miles more next week, a few miles more the week after that, and so on, even though they train and persevere, it still takes courage. It still takes grit. And the pain still comes, and the muscles still ache, and the body cries out for relief. That's the image. But the one who conquers, the one who crosses the line first, is the one who gains the crown. And so in the Christian life, the battle with temptation, the battle with weariness, with opposition, or with disappointments and setbacks, and they happen in every church, that takes faith, fortitude, and hope. The Lord our God commands us to keep going. Remember Jesus persevered to Calvary, how he must have wanted to find an easier way, but persevered, knowing that this was the eternal purpose and plan. And we are to be followers of the Lamb. Remember that the promises are certain and sure. These are not babies or possibilities, but certainties, because it is none other than the living God who promises. And remember, too, that no matter how long you live, death will come soon enough, and then our struggle will end, and then we will meet the Lord. And we will want to meet him not being ashamed, looking in his eyes expectantly, not with shame and dishonor and disgrace. So, persevere. The second promise is a position in the heavenly temple, that word pillar. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. This is metaphorical because in the eternal world there will be no temple. It's metaphorical just as temples were held by pillars. Just as York Minster has magnificent pillars or any of the great cathedrals of Europe, this magnificent architecture that still impresses even after many centuries of, of progress in technology and so on. You just, what one can't be helped but be impressed by the, the skill and the, the, the sheer perseverance of men who labored to do that over so many years, often more than a century, to complete these great buildings. Well, the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. And that's the uh, promise that's made to us. It's a picture of stability a picture of security. And that's what God promises. We go to an eternal, safe, secure, and glorious home with our Lord and our God. And then lastly, this morning, this afternoon, there is a permanent belonging to God. On this pillar, there are three names that you notice that they divide into three. Um, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, not the earthly, the heavenly Jerusalem. And my new name. And the point of these things is that names identify ownership. Um, just this morning, Colin and Jenny took us for a walk around through some fields. It's great to be back in the countryside of Yorkshire. 
and there were some cows and I wandered over to look. I think I said, I think these are short horns. I may be wrong in that, but in their ears was an ear tag with a number. They belong to a certain owner. In other places, they brand the cattle. They put a, a hot iron. This cow, this steer belongs to such and such a person. This is the identification. Or in some cases, you may have some precious piece of jewelry. I have a, a, a watch, a gold watch that my father left to me when he died. He worked for a company for 25 years. And as they used to do in those days, they gave him a gold watch. And on the back of the watch is inscribed his name. Belong to him. The name shows ownership. The emphasis then, this threefold emphasis, is that we belong to God permanently. We are his. And he is ours. Our sovereign God of grace has loved us from all eternity and has planned from eternity to bring us to himself even at the infinite cost of the blood of his only begotten, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Listen to how Peter puts it. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. John might have written these words, which we find in the book of Hebrews. And I finish with a quotation from Hebrews 12, the first three verses. These summarize, I think, much of what I've been trying to say. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that Our gracious, loving God and Father, we do thank you for the comfort, the encouragements and the promises of your word that we have considered together today. Our Father, we live in times when the church is indeed a despised minority in many parts of the world and in some it is physically attacked. We thank you therefore for preserving the light of the gospel in this community for sustaining the work here these many years, for sustaining your servant William and his wife in their labors. And we pray that you would encourage the people of this congregation and enable them to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that their labor in the Lord is not in vain. But, oh, Father, we do pray for days of harvest, not only here, but in your church at large, your church throughout Yorkshire, throughout England, throughout Britain, throughout the world. Oh, for days of harvest. Oh, that you would send your spirit and awaken us again. Oh, that you would bring the power of your gospel into many, many lives in these days. And show your grace and demonstrate your sovereignty and encourage the hearts of your faithful praying people. And, O oh Lord our God, we will give all the glory to you, for we acknowledge our unworthiness, we confess our weakness, but we praise you for your wondrous grace, sovereign power, and amazing mercy. Hear as we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Our concluding hymn is number 370 in the new books and 343 in the old book. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. for the blessing of the Lord by his word. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen.